Good morning. It is good to be able to worship with church family this morning. So glad to see you. I want you to do a couple things. First, I want you to go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 20. We will find ourselves walking through Genesis chapter 20 as a whole as we continue to walk through the book of Genesis together. I also want you to pull your worship folder out and go ahead and pull this card that's in the middle of it. If you're a guest of ours, would you please consider putting your information on this card so we can connect with you, get to know you a little bit. For everybody, if you would consider putting a prayer request on the back side of that card, let us know how we can pray for you and your family. You simply leave it in your seat on your way out, or on your, on your way out there will be baskets for offerings and stuff. You can put them in there as well, uh, and we will connect with you. We really appreciate your help with that. I also want to just remind everybody that tonight you are invited to a prayer service right here, 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, we uh, we want to just have a special time where we come together with more focused time of conversation with God. Let me remind you, as I did last week, let me kind of set the expectation of what you will experience. It will be very simple. Uh, we will come, and the pastors and elders will take turns simply coming up here, reading Scripture. That's part of prayers, to hear what God says to us through His Word. Then that elder and pastor will pray a response to that Scripture, and then we will sing. Okay, so we will do that multiple times. I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, and I trust and anticipate that it will be the first of many types of gatherings where we come in a variety of ways, a variety of formats, just to extend our time as praying, uh, as praying family members in the faith. So tonight at 6 o'clock, if you can make it, we would love to see you here. We are not trying to campaign to see how many people we can stuff in the pews for this. We just want to invite those who would like to come and participate. That's tonight at 6 o'clock. Love to see you there. Here's what I want to do. I want to go ahead and read our passage. We're going to read the whole chapter, Genesis 20, and then we will get into it. Verse 1. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things, and the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you? That you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? Abraham said, I did it because I thought... There is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen, and male servants and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and returned Sarah his wife to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you, and before everyone you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children 
For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Let's pray. God, we we gather before you completely undeserving. God, I just, I pray before brothers and sisters in Christ that you would forgive me, be gracious to me for my, for my indifference, for my arrogance, for the way that I just take for granted so often who you are, especially in light of who I am. Lord, I just beg you that you would lavish us with grace this morning. If it's not for your grace and mercy, we are absolutely undone before a righteous, holy God. And yet, you have seen fit to wake us up, to bring us into this room together, to gather us, to sing praises to your name, to celebrate the glories of the gospel, to open up your word, to hear from you. God, we remind ourselves that we believe the Bible is your word, that when we read it and we seek to understand it rightly and clearly and faithfully, that we are hearing from the one true God of the universe. So Holy Spirit, I pray that this is This is, in a sense, a very anointed, special place right now where completely undeserving sinners are able to hear from a God who loves us and who has shown us that love by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to the cross and by raising him from the dead. By listening to him now as he intercedes for us and by patiently waiting to send him again. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So I want to lovingly tell you that this message is not about you this morning. Churches often make mistakes by trying to preach messages about the people. It's not about you this morning. It's not about me. This message is about God. And in particular, this message is about what God is doing. So there there will not be too much application for you and me. We are simply going to try to express gratitude. We are simply going to try to celebrate what God is doing because that's what this text shows us. This text shows us what God does. Let me summarize it. God sovereignly spared Abimelech, spoiled Abraham, and secured Sarah in spite of all their sin. That's the summary of the text. Every word matters. God sovereignly spared Abimelech, spoiled Abraham, and secured Sarah in spite of their sin. So here's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to celebrate that God sovereignly spares us and spoils us and secures us in spite of all our sin. So the presupposition, I, I, please forgive me for using such a big word this early in the morning. The presupposition this morning, what we need to go ahead and just assume, the given this morning is our sin. It's just a given. In one sense, it could go without saying. The problem is it often goes without saying. We need to remind ourselves then we are sinners. It's the presupposition. It's what we have brought to the table this morning. All that you and I have really brought to the table this morning as we came to church, we just brought our sinfulness again. That's the presupposition. Believe it or not, this is good news. This is actually intended to encourage us 
So the given reality of our condition before God this morning is our sinfulness. And I want us to see from Genesis chapter 20 what God does with us. First, God spares us. But let me extend the statement so that we're clear on what we're spared from. God spares us from his wrath. We are a wrath-preaching church at Chapin Baptist. We're also a love-preaching church. You can't have one without the other, by the way. So God spares us from his wrath. Go to verse 1. Start walking back through the text. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. So we're reminded he is on the go in his life. He is a journeyman. Says that he sojourned in Gerar. Now the word for sojourn, he's a stranger. It's the word gur. He gird in Gerar. This is a little pun here. If we, if we all knew Hebrew, which by the way, let me be clear. I am not fluent with Hebrew. I just want to, I'm not trying to give that impression. But if we were, oh, if we knew how rich the word is. He gird in Gerar. That's what we're being told. He's on the go. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, let me also tell you this one thing I learned. Looking in the dictionary for Hebrew words, Gerar, it happens to me. That's just my two cents. My two cents here. Gerar sounds a lot like their word for snatch. So look at what happens. The king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. It's almost like that is even intentional in the Hebrew language. He, he snatched her. He took her. Now, if you've been walking through the book of Genesis with me for the last several weeks, and you see that Abraham tells people Sarah's his sister, you say, again? He did this again? Like, husbands, I told you, I believe, last time, don't do that. I'm going to tell you again, don't do it twice. Now, go back to chapter 12. I want you to see it. I want us to soak it in. Chapter 12, verse 10. There was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt. Okay, he's on the go. He went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to, Sarah, his, to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. That's his reasoning. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. So, so far, he knew what he was talking about. But let's see what he learns. For her sake, he, that's Pharaoh, dealt well with Abram. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But, and here's what Abraham should be learning, here's what we need to be reminded of, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. There is something special about this woman. God is not going to let her be dealt with like this. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Like he totally obliterates Abram's reasoning. You should have just told me she was your wife and we wouldn't be in this predicament. That's what Pharaoh's telling him. Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. You may remember how we pointed out how many times the word wife just boom, boom, boom. This is his wife. On top of that, God has just, in previous chapters, chapter 18 and 19, just shown two things, that Sarah will have a child by Abraham, and he's also showing how serious he is about his business by destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet, after all this, Abraham, again, gives in to this reasoning. She's my sister. Bimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took her. 
By the way, she was 89 years old. Maybe the king was old too, I don't know. Matter of fact, some speculate, understandably so, maybe this was in pursuit of an alliance. So he took Sarah. Now watch what God does. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man. Just imagine that dream. You are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. That's what God does. Now, I want to call a brief time out. I want, to, I want to just take one step to the side of the main essence of this text. We will get back into the main thrust of the text. I want to speak to husbands in here. Because not for one second do I think that in a gathering of this size, that we're free from this predicament. Husbands, you do your own soul searching, and you ask yourself, do I need to hear God speak to me like this? Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken, for she is a man's wife. I just want that to land for anybody that it needs to land on. God takes your marriage seriously. It is a matter of life and death. Verse 4. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Now we've heard this question before, have we not? Abraham interceding in behalf of Lot and Lot's family when God was going to visit judgment upon Sodom. You're not going to wipe out the innocent with the wicked. What did we learn? Weren't very many innocent people to be found. Now the king of Gerar, you're not, you're not going to kill an innocent people. Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. Look at what he says. In the integrity of my heart, mm-hmm. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Just in case you need to be reminded, you cannot say that. We cannot say that. That is not true about us. Not deep down. God said to him, look how gracious he is. God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you've done this in the integrity of your heart. You know what that means? All that means is the king didn't know that Sarah was his wife. That's all it means. He's like, yes, I know. I know, I know they told you that she was a sister, but look at what God says. It was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. And we've heard that phrase before. You shall surely die. That's what God told Adam and Eve. Don't you disobey me. You shall surely die. Now I want to keep reading. We're going to dip into the next section real quick. I want you to see Abimelech continuing to think he's innocent. So Abimelech arose early in the morning, called all of his servants, told them all these things. The men were very much afraid, and Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us, and how have I sinned against you? Was it sinning against Abram that God was worried about? No, it was sinning against God. What have I sinned against you? How have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. We'll actually go back over those verses in a minute, but I wanted to read that little statement right there. You've done to me things that ought not to be done. And I would like to ask Abimelech, oh really, what were you planning on doing? You are trying to do things you ought not to do. You see, God spares us from his wrath. Let's learn something from Abimelech's situation. Listen to this. You and I are way more guilty than we are innocent. Do you realize that? Do you realize that life is not about trying to weigh in the balance 
how much good you think you bring to the table versus how much bad you bring to the table. Do you realize that is not the gospel you want? You will lose that judgment. You and I are way more guilty than we are innocent. Abimelech was way more guilty than he was innocent. His innocence was shallow, sure. He was told, this woman is my sister. Okay, well then I'll just take her to be mine. The innocence was shallow. The guilt was deep. You know what he was guilty of? Think about it this way. In Genesis 19, we watched... A culture that had gotten so depraved that there was this, ep- this effort of forced homosexual rape. Now we watch a king who thinks he's innocent, but he's guilty of regal rape. I'm the king. I want that woman. Bring her to me. That's not pleasing in the eyes of a holy righteous God he thought he was innocent his innocence was shallow his guilt was deep our innocence we think we come here pretty good people our innocence is shallow also and our guilt is deep let me remind you let me remind you of something Jesus says two examples of shallow innocence, so we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're actually pretty good, but deep guilt. Jesus once said this, he was preaching. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And so easily we could have the tendency to say, well, you know what? Never done that. I've never murdered anybody. You're probably glad to know that since I'm your pastor. Jesus says, but, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Look, our innocence is shallow. Our guilt runs deep. Am I a murderer? Yes. According to Jesus' definition, I would be considered a serial murderer. He would go on to say this, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And so many of us, good, not done that. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, my innocence may run shallow, but my guilt goes deep. Right there, Jesus has every one of us in one form or fashion. And we need to let Genesis 20, as we watch a man like Abimelech think he's innocent, we need to let it remind us that our guilt runs deep. And nevertheless, this is where we have the gospel, nevertheless, God is sovereignly sparing you every second. Right now, I need you to grasp this reality. We as a church need to consistently grasp this truth that God is sovereignly sparing us every second from His wrath. You are being spared from God's judgment. That's what you and I deserve. Sin deserves the wages of death. And that's what we deserve, but God spares us, and he does so sovereignly. God tells Abimelech, I am the one keeping you from sinning against me. I didn't let you touch her. You're breathing this morning. Every breath you take is a moment of a sovereign God sparing you what you deserve. In 2 Peter, we're reminded that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day, and God is patient toward us, not wanting any of us to perish. He's sparing you. I want you to thank God for what he's doing right now. 
thank God for sparing you from what you deserve. Not only does God spare us from his wrath, God spoils us for his plans. Let's go back to Genesis 20, verse 8. God spoils us for his plans. We're going to see God spoil Abraham. Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all of his servants, told them all these things. I want you to note this. And the men were very much afraid. It's quite a significant difference than the men in Sodom, isn't it? The men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us, and how have I sinned against you, that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. We've already addressed that. Abraham apparently doesn't say anything. Abimelech keeps talking in verse 10. Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? Now look at what Abraham says, verse 11. Abraham said, I did it because I thought... There is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Now look again, the first part of what he says. I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. That's not true, is it? Go back up to verse 8. The men were very much afraid. There was at least some sincere semblance of fear of God. Abraham assumed things. He he essentially assumed, and we can can fall into this trap. He essentially assumed that there wasn't the presence of God in that place. And we cannot assume that. God is omnipresent. And God is to be feared and revered and reverenced. And he demands awe. So Abraham assumed wrong. There was fear. He keeps talking in verse 12, besides, she is indeed my sister. So we're just now learning this sort of awkward detail about their family. She is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, I said awkward, which it is to us. It wouldn't have been as awkward in that day, and yet it is sort of an evidence of Abraham really trying to use a loophole around his reasoning. He's trying to wiggle around his lack of faith. Then look at what he does. It almost sounds like he blames God. Verse 13, when God caused me to wander from my uh, father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do me at every place to which we come. Say of me, he is my brother. You know, ever since God made me leave, this is how I've had to live. But look at what a sovereign God brings about. Verse 14. Then Abimelech, this is mind-blowing to me. Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham. Just like Pharaoh did. Like, Abraham keeps profiting off of this little strategy here. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. What? What is happening? What's happening is God is spoiling Abraham according to his plan. In Genesis 12, God approached Abram. He essentially promised him three things. Blessings, offspring, and land. And here in this little episode, what do we see Abraham get? Blessings of stuff. Now, you may not be in the market for sheep and oxen, but that was like the stuff of the day. More stuff. More people. God blessed him. God returned Sarah, his wife. He preserved the hope of offspring that he had promised. And Abimelech says, hey, my land, just take whatever you want. God is spoiling Abraham according to his plans. According to his promises And we need to know that God does the same thing for us. God spoils us according to his plans. I just want to tell you something. You are spoiled rotten. You are. I am too. 
Sometimes we need to take inventory of how spoiled rotten we are. I've done this before several times. I bet you woke up to air conditioning this morning because you're a spoiled rotten brat. That's why, because God is that good to you. You chose your clothing today. You chose it. You looked through your closet. Which, which would I like to wear today? You choose your meals today. You get in your car. You sit in your pew with cushions in it. Now, I know they're not the most comfortable thing. Sometimes while I'm having to sit there for a while, I'm like, this is what they go through while I'm preaching. But you got cushions, and we got air conditioning, electricity. And I bet you've had people be nice to you this morning. We're spoiled. Let's go one layer deeper, and let's celebrate how God has absolutely spoiled this church. Rotten sometimes. We have wonderful people at this church. If you're new to this church, I want to tell you, I want to be the first to tell you, this church is filled with amazing people. And I mean that. I don't just say things like that. We're spoiled with wonderful, loving people, amazing personalities who come with all of these experiences and giftings and passions. And and when new people come and we get to know them, I find myself thinking, why did God bring these people here? What does he want to do to them? We're spoiled with people. We are spoiled with resources. Chapin Baptist Church is spoiled with resources. Property, buildings, budgeting. We're spoiled with opportunities, and we want to be faithful stewards of those opportunities. But listen, we need to know this. And let me say, let me remind remind you, we're not perfect. We all know that. Cracks in the bucket always will be this side of heaven. But if we don't realize we are spoiled by a gracious God, then we're just refusing to see what's right in front of our face as a church. You can be spoiled rotten sometimes. We need to be careful of that. God has spoiled us. He's spoiled us, and not just on the surface, but deep, deep down. He has given us so much. I want to ask you to go to the book of Ephesians real quick with me. Go to Ephesians 1 and, and just keep your place there and in Genesis, because we're actually going to re- revisit Ephesians more than once here. I want us to try, I want us to glance at Ephesians 1. Now, when I say glance, I say it on purpose because you, you don't just read Ephesians 1 once and get it. I was reading through Ephesians back in December as part of my quiet time reading, and I just remember trying to wrap my brain around what it was being said. We won't get into it. I can't, one day I can't wait to preach through Ephesians. I want to glance at Ephesians 1 because I promise you I will read it slowly to you, but we will not walk out of here grasping everything in this. But let's just try to hear one portion of Scripture and how God has lavished his grace over us. Ephesians 1, I want to begin reading in verse 3. I'm going to read through verse 10 for this moment. We'll come back later. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, you ready? Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now I'd say try to wrap your mind around that, but I don't want you to because you won't be able to listen to what I read next. Just let it slap you in the face, and then let's keep going. Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him. Now if you are not a follower of Christ, I really want you to hear this. In him. In Christ. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. That is a word for sin. If you're not a follower of Christ, I need you to know this. It's in Christ that you have redemption, and it's through his blood, his sacrifice on the cross, that you have forgiveness for your sin. That's the presupposition we bring to the table, our sinfulness. How's that problem going to be dealt with? Right here, Jesus' blood, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan 
for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God spoils us for his plans. All I want you to do this morning is thank God for what he's doing, spoiling you over and over. It's like my parents spoiling my children. Some of y'all are grandparents. You lost your spine when you got grandkids too. All the standards went out the window. Oh, they want this? Let's give it to them. They want that? Let's give them to them. They can't agree on what dinner is? Let's just get them each whatever they want. I tell them, y'all are pathetic. Spoiling them rotten, and God is just lavishing His grace all over you today. I know that there are hard things going on. I know there are challenges. We're not minimizing any of that at this church, I promise. Sometimes I worry that maybe I bring those challenges up too frequently. Today, it's all about a God, a heavenly Father who loves you so much. He just, he just takes his pocket and says, grace and grace and grace. And here's more and here's more. And we don't deserve any of it. He's doing it for his plans. He's spoiling us. Let's thank God for what he's doing. Let's also, let's also see that God secures us as his bride. Back in Genesis 20 now, God secures us. He spares us from his wrath. He spoils us according to his plans. He secures us as his bride. Verse 16, to Sarah, Abimelech said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. All right, you want to know how much that was worth? Roughly 175 years worth of pay. Not bad. Not bad. Hey, I'll go hang out with the king for a night. As long as he don't touch me for 175 years worth of pay. That's a lot of money. This is a lavish amount. This is a generous payment. Look at why. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone you are vindicated. A lavish amount was paid to declare that Sarah was innocent and vindicated. Hmm. Then Abraham prayed to God. Remember, he's the prophet. The first time the word prophet appears in the Bible is in this chapter. Abraham prayed to God. He's interceding for Abimelech. God healed Abimelech. Look at what happened. And also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah Abraham's wife. God says, you do not mess with my chosen wife. God secured Sarah as Abraham's wife. The gospel is about God securing us as his bride. I want you to know this. God has paid generously to declare us innocent before his eyes. Now that word generously, that's actually a weak word compared to what it should be. I don't know that we have words for the amount that God has paid to declare us innocent and vindicated before his eyes, his holy, just, righteous eyes looking at us and all of our sinfulness and all of our impurity falling so immeasurably far short of his glory. And yet God paid generously for you to be innocent. And it was way more than 175 years worth of money. He sent his son. He sent his son to the cross. He gave his son to declare us innocent, to vindicate us before him. I want you to go back to Ephesians 1. I hope you held your place there. Ephesians 1. I want to begin reading where we left off, verse 11. We bring it home. Ephesians 1, verse 11. In him, it's in Christ, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Again, I'd say try to wrap your head around it, but you can't. Just roll with it for right now. So that we 
who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed, I would say, were secured, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. God secures us as his bride. Now, I want to go back to Genesis 20 for one more moment. As we close, I want to acknowledge that in the midst of all of this good news, I realize that there can be, among many of us perhaps, this hesitance. Still, maybe, maybe you need to hear a little more gospel hope. Maybe you need just a little more evidence that in light of everything going on in your life, in light of everything swirling around your world, you need a little more evidence that God is doing his work and that he knows what he's doing. Go back to Genesis 20, verse 18. For the Lord, now that is the word Yahweh. It's used, I believe, as emphasis to kind of culminate what's happening in this episode here. The Lord, Yahweh, had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, just keep reading two verses with me. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. I hope you're able to come back next week as we get into chapter 21. But I want you to see God closed the wounds for a reason. Because there was a closed womb in Sarah that he had plans for. There was a son coming, a son through whom redemptive history would be carried out into the next phases. And when we celebrate Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we're celebrating the Son who culminates our redemption. God is doing his work among us, and he knows what he's doing. Let's thank him for what he's been doing all along. Close your eyes, bow your heads with me. God, we thank you. We celebrate. We are are celebrating today in response to this passage of scripture that you are doing redemptive work among us, that you know what you're doing, and that what you're doing today is in accordance with what you've been doing all this time. God, I pray, I pray, I pray a prayer that goes for every one of us in here that we would realize and appreciate the biblical truth that you, every single second of our life, you sovereignly spare us from what we deserve in our sin. I pray that every one of us, every single one of us would realize a fraction of how you are spoiling us according to your plan. God, I pray that we would celebrate, every one of us. I pray that every one of us is able to celebrate that you have secured us as your bride. And God, we acknowledge that there is only one way to experience that security, and it is in Jesus Christ alone. So we celebrate in his name. Amen. Would you stand as we respond to God's word this morning? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. God be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or 
are sleeping, thy presence, thy light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor men's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only first in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O still be my vision, O ruler of all. For your benediction, I want to go one more time to Ephesians. I want to, I want to just keep reading. Receive these words from Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 20. For this reason, Paul says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Amen.